Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody is doing okay. Welcome in to the Inspirational Anna Show, the show that aims to inspire you, encourage you, and join you to live your full potential. I'm excited today about the woman we are speaking with, powerful. The word powerful doesn't describe her enough. But as I go around looking for positive stories, stories that will impact you and impact me, this is one woman I want to talk about because I have seen her work hard. I have seen her go, grow from, from, what's the word I'm looking for? From success to success. And I know that she's not even done. She hasn't even scratched the surface because I know her, I know what she's capable of, and we're all behind her as she makes a difference and an impact. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me bring on Nana Abba Duncan, our guest for today. Hey! Hey! Look at that <laughs> smile. That smile just kills me. It's <laughs> Don't die, Auntie. Don't die, please. I can't die. I have to live. I have to live to ride with you to where you're going, yeah. for the impact that you're going to have, for the other people that you're going to inspire. Now, mind you, it's not just young people; it is all of us. Mm -hmm. Because it's nice when you see another woman yeah. becoming successful on her journey. Yeah. It makes you smile, even in your couch. Like when I'm rocking in my couch back and forth, I'm like, oh, see that one. Welcome to the Inspirational Anna Show. Thank you for having me. This show is all about, as the name says, Inspirational Anna. My goal in life is to inspire, is to tell positive stories, is to honor positive stories, and to put my stamp of positivity on humanity and on society. So, you know what? I don't want to miss anything about you so i want you to tell us about yourself now mind you one thing i don't do anymore is hide the good things that i'm doing <laughs> i don't know if you've heard snoop dogg's statement i want to thank me for me you know that's my <laughs> thing right now so so that i don't miss any good thing that you're doing please Tell us about yourself. Okay. So my name is Nanaba, Nanaba Duncan. And I was born in Ghana and I've been and uh, raised in Canada since I was two years old. And my current role, uh, my title is an associate professor at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. I'm also the CARDI chair in journalism, diversity and inclusion studies there. And I'm also um, one of three co-founders of Media Girlfriends, which is a production company. We uh, mainly deal in podcasts. We have a few, um, uh, uh, we have an award-winning podcasts. And um, we really, as a company, Media Girlfriends aims to uh, support more and diverse voices and perspectives in media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I was to describe myself, I think I'm, I think I'm ambitious. I've, I've always been ambitious. I think that's really part of who I am. But mm -hmm. I think another part of who I am is uh, like, I'm a naturally joyful person. I think that's what, yeah. that's how people know me. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. So when you say that, I know you have, children yeah how many i have two. Oh, two. how old are they they're seven and ten. Seven and ten also Ofe and ebo and ebo oh, Ofe and and Ofe. okay okay nice so you're a busy woman mm -hmm. you're, you're a very busy woman so but that is the beauty of who you are right you don't leave anything on the table you bring yourself to everything that you do. I knew you for the longest time as a radio host. Yes. Right? 
So yes, I, I guess that's the part that I forgot. At, I forgot, which is that for yes. 15 years, I was a radio host and producer at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and during that time, I hosted a number of shows. I guest hosted a number of shows and, and produced for a lot. A lot of that was in the music um, for about six years, I was in the music department and the latest, the last job that I had, the one that um, I find that people know me for when I'm just out in the world is a show called Fresh Air, which was a weekend morning show okay. on um, that, that was broadcast from Toronto, but went to all of Ontario every weekend morning to about 300,000 people wow. um, every Saturday and Sunday from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And wow. that show um was you know we played music i interviewed people just like what you're doing right i interviewed people and um but the one thing that i didn't uh really broadcast on air because there was no reason to talk about it necessarily is that i was also the chair of uh, the co-chair of an organization of an as of an um employee resource group called Diversify CBC. And this was the employee resource group of about 300 to 400 people um, across uh, CBC of racialized employees. That's what the group did, was about. Wow, you, you've you held down quite a few um, jobs. And do you find that you naturally go into jobs that fills your spirit? Because you said along the way that you're a naturally happy person. I know that I'm a very naturally happy person. So no matter what is going on, I gear towards things that bring out the best in me, that makes me happy. And not just me, but everybody that comes my way. Do you find that the jobs that you've held come along your happy spiritual self? Uh, not all the time, they didn't all the time. But I oh. think for most, for, I think for a lot of my career, I was being ambitious, but also thinking about what I, felt that I had to do. Mm. And it, um, so I would say it's sort of like two streams. There was this deep ambition in me to host a show. I wanted to host a show for the longest time. I also wanted to interview people for the longest time. Right. But I also think that um, I was driven by um, like, a, a, like it was a, a necessity to succeed mm. in a certain way and that didn't always mean exactly what I wanted to do. What you wanted. So, and 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 that, honestly, that comes from like the upbringing, like growing up, auntie, I know you'll understand this. Growing up, um, I remember there's a time during high school when I wanted to get into photography and art and daddy said, no. <laughs> like daddy said, no, I'm not supposed to. And, up, and no. no, he's just straight up said no. So um, I had, I always had an artistic side, but I was geared in a way to the academics, which also worked for me, but right. you know, but it, it's no surprise to me that I ended up in something that has a creative side to it. That you know what right. I mean. Right, um, right, right. So to answer the question, I would say that yes, I would say that I am now more leaning to things that not only fulfill me, but are helping other people who are like me or who may understand my perspective. Yeah, that's what I would say. yeah. So that is awesome. You, so I would say that you're living part of your life with your authentic self. Yeah, I think I am. Yeah, because I, 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 I know that with me, doing this is, I so look forward to it. I so mm. look forward to speaking with people and finding out about it. It just fills me up as I go up and down each day. But so you went from CBC, you were there for 15 years to an associate professor at Carleton University. What has that change been like? Um, it's been difficult. And mm. it's been difficult because it's it's new. Whenever mm. you do something new, there's a learning curve. I'm right. only going into my third year. So there's right. been a big learning curve. Right. I'm going from working on one show with one or two other people, thinking every week about different things, coming up with ideas. I have a small team. That's mm. how I worked on the show on Fresh Air. Right, right. And then going from there to, I have to create something on my own. I no longer have a team. I no longer have anybody to bounce ideas off of, but I also have um, a specific time that I'm supposed to 
present and also lecture to somebody. So those are, those are, those are, that's a really new thing. Right. And on top of that, I'm not doing it on the air to these unseen people. I'm not do doing it in the class to a number of seen people who are going to ask questions and, and um, interact with me in the moment. I actually love that part. Like I love to me, it's like live performance. That's I, I love it. It's, it's right. perfect for me. Right. However, um, I would say that the concern now is um, very normal for someone who is new to being a professor or an academic, which is, am I doing this right? Are they getting what they need to do? They need to get, uh, are they learning what they need to learn? Is Those questions come. And so um, what I'm admitting to is how um, when you're learning something new, you're not always sure of yourself. So right. I'm still, so I acknowledge, I acknowledge that that's, a stage that happens, mm -hmm. but I'll mm -hmm. also acknowledge that um, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't able to do it. That's I right. wouldn't, I wouldn't have been given the job if I wasn't, if, if, if it wasn't um, decided by a group of people mm -hmm. um, who have done the job before that I could do this. Right. I so I, if, if I have any moments of, ah, I might do it like, <laughs> is this working? <laughs> um, then, then I just have to fall on that, or I fall on, frankly, what the students have said after classes. Right. You know? And what they've right. said are wonderful, wonderful things. Because so the feedback from the feedback, you know that your target group is yeah. getting the message. Yeah, they are. That whatever you need to say to them is going through. How how fulfilling and how exciting it is is it whenever you get feedback from your target group. I know when somebody says to me, oh, Anna, oh, thank you so much. I'm like, phew, right? I'm like, so how how does it make you feel? I know it makes uh, me feel good. No, it doesn't. No, I'm just joking. Of course it makes me feel good. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's it's uh, it, hits, it hits my ego. It makes me feel good about myself, all of that. But I think what's really more important is that it reflects that they are, that they are learning, mm -hmm. and it re it reflects that um, that you know they're getting their money's worth, and <laughs> that they're they're getting what they need to do. And it also reflects that um, these these people are are on their way. Um, right. But to be honest with you, it it feels good. Like it's good for me to know um, that what I'm doing is is making an impact. It's really really cool. Nice, nice. It makes you feel like you're adding your voice to society. Yeah, and not only that, um, I'm really aware that um, I'm told that I'm the first um, tenure track, the first black woman to be, or a black person to be a tenure track at the School of Journalism at Carleton. And this is the oldest, uh, the oldest uh, journalism school in the country. And the position, the Cardi Chair in Journalism, Diversity and Inclusion Studies, is the only one that, um, the only one of its kind in Canada, and one of two in in North America. So um, there's a lot of these firsts and all that kind of stuff that, you know, th they're interesting and kind of sad in 2023. But mm. I think what what is great for me is knowing that these students have had a black teacher, mm -hmm. that they've had a black professor, that they have had someone in this authoritative position Yes. that is teaching them. That is important in an intangible way that I'm not even sure I'm able to articulate, but mm. I have this understanding that it is helping to change some stereotypes they may have right. in mind. Right, right. That's important and, to me. And then it also matters to the black students. Like I have this black woman professor, like that's- so Right, they, right. I remember when I got the job, on Instagram, there was a student who wrote to me to say, I'm so happy you're coming. Like, this is so cool. Nice, nice. So when you say tenure track, what does that mean? For yeah, those I'll of explain that are not I think in it's, academia. Yeah, this is something that a lot of people uh, don't know necessarily. So um, tenure basically means that you will work there forever, unless something egregious happens. Okay. But it's okay. like, permanent employment really okay. so okay. tenure track means i am on track 
okay. to be tenured as a professor. Okay. Um, that track for me as an associate professor is three years. I'm now going into my third year. And this, okay. is the, this is the year in which I'm eligible to go up for tenure. That's the language. I go okay. up for tenure, which means I present to them everything that I have done in research, service, and teaching to show them that I am uh, worthy of being a person who will now just get this check forever un unless I've done something bad. Like, right. I, I don't even want to say what bad <laughs> things, but, you know, um, and that is something that a lot of professors talk about, like in academia, talking mm -hmm. about tenure is a huge thing and, mm -hmm. and putting together what's called your tenure dossier, which is a huge document that includes all, all of the things that you have done and, and things that you are in the process of doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big deal for academics. So um, it's definitely something, if I get it, my mother will be proud. All of us will be proud, not just your mother. <laughs> It's not just your mother. Yeah. It will be dragging you all over the place. You can't <laughs> get too tired. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get too tired. But on a more serious note, I like that you said that a lot of this is good for Black students. I think it is good for all students. It in, is. In the sense that, you know, for so long, Black people were put in a, in a place of inferiority, right? And... For the longest time, I, I don't know if I should say we bought into it, or I don't know the word. I know that for those of us that grew up in Ghana, this, whilst we respect our people, we know that this is normal, right? Whereas in North America, because of slavery and everything, we wouldn't say it's normal, but it's good for all students. Do you think that you standing there is correcting a bit? of the, what's the word I'm looking for? The idea that's been placed on black people of being incompetent. Of well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It is, it is, it is doing its way to chip away at any stereotype the students might have about uh, a, a black people, a black woman, a black woman. It, it is, it is helping to erase that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Cause I know that um, a lot of times when you see a black still in this day and age, when you see a black person for us black people, when you see a black person in a respectful high position, you feel good about yourself. Yeah. Why? Because we don't have too many role models and mentors and things like that for us to, to go to easily in Ghana. It was easy. All you have to yeah. do is step out. You're going to work. You're going to school, you're going to church, you're going to visit your doctor. It was right in your face. But here in Canada, so congratulations. 15 years on CBC as a radio host and now um, associate professor at in journalism and finish the rest for me. Uh, the, the, the department is called journalism and communication. Journalism and communication. And so now let's come to where you have the diversity and inclusion part, right? I'm hearing that a lot these days. What does that mean in <laughs> terms of... Because, <laughs> you know, we need a lot of things to be broken down for us so we can get with it, mm -hmm. right? So um, the diversity and inclusion, what does it mean and what's the point mm -hmm. of it? So the, the, the chair, this chair position that I have in journalism, diversity and inclusion studies is a way for the school to make sure that um, inclusion, diversity, uh, to my mind, belonging and justice, that these values are not missed while the students are doing their courses. So I, I've created a course called Journalism and Belonging. And this is a course where we recognize and acknowledge that um, 
that there is, that there has been inequality in the way that things have been produced in Canadian media, but also that there has been an inequality experience within um, media production uh, and among uh, journalists uh, who are from marginalized communicate uh, marginalized communities. So, um, it, so I myself, as a black journalist, I have experienced racism at work. I have experienced. Um, uh, I have seen how um, racist um, uh, uh, racist news has been produced. I've seen. Uh, I've witnessed racist thinking. In um, I've witnessed racist thinking in editorial meetings, all that kind of stuff. So to, to answer the question, um, at least at my school, the idea is that I'm going to not, uh, I am there to just remind everyone that this is something that we need to think about. And yeah. so some of the things that I've done is, you know, I've, I've got some uh, uh, journalism, um, uh, uh, racialized journalism students together uh, so that they could meet, meet up. I have um, uh, this course that I have, I created the journalism and belonging course. I mm -hmm. also teach um, a first year journalism course and I include some of these um, principles, uh, whether it's through readings or conversations, lectures that I have, um, because the idea is, is so th the idea is that we want journalists or people who are doing any storytelling, whether or not they're doing it in journalism or communication, whatever it is that people end up doing, that they recognize that um, there are there are stories that have have typically been excluded mm -hmm. in um, in mainstream uh, storytelling okay. practices, okay. and so there are things that they can do to make sure that what they're doing is more equitable. And for example, some of those are uh, using appropriate language, avoiding language that is harmful. Um, so um, I'm not sure that you have noticed this, but there is a term, for example, called the uh, unhoused, as opposed to using homeless, mm. unhoused is a term that people are using. And I mean, language changes. So it's very easy for people to go, well, I don't know what to use right now. But at the moment, there is a move to use the term unhoused for people because right. it, 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 it really pinpoints how a person doesn't have something that mm -hmm. many people do, an That's unhoused it. person, right? Um, Not a and, person. Well, and the thing is that it essentially it means the same thing, but right. we all now use the term, many people, uh, when they hear the term homeless, it is like a derogatory thing. It makes people yes. immediately think of a person as less than human sometimes. Right. And so by right. saying unhoused, it is a way for us to trigger our mind to think differently. So yes. um, I'm sure you know that we've also moved from using the term Aboriginal to Indigenous in this country. And that's right. that's on purpose, right? right. So um, in our courses, some of the things that I do is I'm using uh, readings that include Indigenous people. I'm using readings um, that are uh, uh, using examples of good, of good reporting specifically by Indigenous reporters. I am letting students know about the experiences of Indigenous reporters in the newsrooms and i'm also letting them know uh, something that our school is doing is that they must take indigenous history courses as well so this and that's not something that i that, that that's something that was happening before i came but um these are some of the examples of how of how we're trying to make things uh more equitable so trying to think of the people who've been excluded in 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 the news in a proper way right. um you know like with the black community um, uh, and the different black communities in Canada, we are doing our best to make sure that not all the stories are about the bad areas in, right. in the country. And right. rather we are, um, yeah, uh, the stories uh, are, are including black communities when regular things are happening. When we have experts, we are looking for, these are things that I want people to think about, that when you're looking for experts, don't always look for somebody who looks like you. Don't always look for somebody who talks like you. We want people who have accents. Accents is, I always say that accent is relative to where you're from. And always an accent means that someone speaks more than the language that they're speaking to you in. And this is always a plus. So these are the things that we have to think about. 
I love it. I love the fact that so you're not only a <laughs> you're not only a professor. You're more than just standing in a classroom and talking to people. You're feeding the minds of these people who are coming through your courses, who are meeting you in different places. You're feeding the minds and broadening the minds of these people to think beyond the status quo. You know, like before, you know how it is. Sometimes we say in Ghana, oh, media make us slangs. In other words, make out what? Make out slang. We slang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and today is slang now, okay? Make me there, make me tree. Okay. <laughs> Make me tree, and I make me bro for pepe pepe, just like okay. you and I are doing now. But we tend to sometimes pride ourselves on the fact that we speak a certain way outside of our genuine and authentic selves. So I like that the system that you're in is drawing people's attention. Even a person like me, in doing these things, I have to learn. If I want to be successful, I have to learn to open my mind. So now let's come to media girlfriends. So you're a professor. You did, you hosted a radio show for 15 years. You have children. You're married. You're a daughter. You wear all sorts of hats. But what made you then decide to start the media okay. girlfriend? Is it a, it's, it's a business, correct? It's a business. So uh, here's what happened. In 2016, I was working at CBC and I was hosting I was hosting a show um, uh, that was, it was actually a music show. It was the Radio 2 Top 20. And it was a music countdown show where I was not interviewing people. I was talking, I was on the air, but I knew that I wanted to interview people. I was missing that. I have always loved podcasts for many, many years. Mm. And I wanted to, I wanted a vehicle through which I could, I wanted to prove that I could interview. And I knew that by starting a podcast and interviewing people that that would then, I would then have something that shows I can interview people. So um, here's what happened. I decided that I would interview women um, who were in the media and talk about their experiences. And the reason I thought I would basically choose my friends who also knew how to host and the reason I, why I choose them is because they would be able to tell me whether or not what I did was <laughs> good or not. Like they would be able to say, oh, that was a good interview or that was not a good interview. Right. Anyway, so in the in the process, what I did was, so Media Girlfriends was a podcast in the beginning. Oh, okay. And it was a podcast where I was interviewing these women, talking about the behind the scenes of being a woman journalist in Canada. And what happened, because my friends were, uh people of color we were some of us are queer some of us what have children some of us will never have children some of us are into politics mm -hmm. what happened was that my industry my little corner of the journalism industry was like oh who are yeah. these folks yeah. so i remember there's a show called metro morning a long time ago a man named matt galloway used to host this show and he was a really and he is a very well-known host and yeah. i remember i was walking down the hallway i also worked on a show like near near him um, like in the same on the same floor and he stopped me and he was like oh I heard that episode on blah 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 and I remember thinking you're listening to my podcast so what was <laughs> happening was that I would have this podcast and I was just putting it out I wasn't thinking right. necessarily that my People peers like were listening I just needed to put this thing out so right. media girlfriends grew because the women that I was interviewing and I, I, I at one point put a number of us in a chat group on Twitter and this chat group ended up being the locus of our support system. Mm -hmm. So we started to support each other in how we negotiate for salary. We started to come to the group to say, this weird thing happened just now with my manager. Was this racist? Like, I don't, well, I don't know what happened. And everybody's like, yeah, that was racist. Like, I don't know what's going on. Or, or, and then somebody else might be like, you know, this thing is happening with my kids. I don't know what to do. So it became this place where we were really just supporting each other. And right. then eventually um, we came together. Somebody had rented a cottage or something. And me, I'm sitting there with my pen and people are like, media girlfriends is a thing. Like we should do something. We should do something. So I'm writing down all the idea, I, these ideas. 
And one of the ideas that came from my, my very good girlfriend, Jennifer Hollett, who's the executive director of a magazine called The Walrus, um, she said, you know, we should do scholarships and I'll work on it with you. So with the two of us, we started trying to fundraise for okay. scholarships with media, okay. for media girlfriends. Yeah. And we originally wanted $2,000. We told all of our friends on Twitter and we ended up getting 14,000. The next year we got 20,000. And I think the next year we got 30,000. Essentially we've given away about 70 to $80,000 in scholarships. Wow. And the scholarships were for, um, um, uh, women trans and non-binary uh, students who wanted to go into journalism or, or communications or media um, or, uh, or tech. And so we're very, I'm very proud that we gave away uh, that money. And I'm really proud that M Media Girlfriends just kind of grew into this thing because I believed in myself in that moment. Mm. Now what's happening with Media Girlfriends is that we moved into being a podcast production company. And okay. that's because two of my friends, Garvia Bailey and Hannah Sung, who already have their own background in audio production and also as hosts, they were kind of looking at me going, Naba, let's start a company. Like, let's, let's do something. Because among us, we know how to produce. We can do things. We can get a client and we can make money. Like, we can do this. And I, at first, was like, no. I don't <laughs> want to do it. And the reason was because I love them so much. These are my friends, auntie. Yeah, I know. You're not trying to rob anybody. I'm not, I, I'm not trying to, I like, I, literally, I remember we all sat down one day. I was crying because I said, I don't, I yeah, am afraid of what's going to happen. I love you all so much. I don't want us to come into a, a I'm, I'm even feeling it now. I don't want us to come to a place where now we're not together because we were trying to do something with business and money. No, I don't want to do that. Right. Eventually. I don't know what happened. I think I was in a space where I was just more open to it. And a friend of mine uh, sent us a something from an organization called Historica Canada. And Historica Canada was looking for um, a podcast production company to make a Black history podcast and video series. Okay. And so in the summer of 2021, I think, my friend sent this to us. It was like a request for proposal. And the three of us kind of looked at each other and said, well, I guess we're a company. Let's do this. So we, put, so we, you know, we put our application in and then we ended up getting it. We created something called, we created a six episode bilingual, um, six episodes in English, six episodes in French, bilingual podcast and video series on Black History in Canada. It's called Strong and Free, Fort et Libre, and it has won several awards, including international awards. And I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah. So, and there were, that was just, it was a beautiful experience. I was working with my friends and and today I'm working with my friends. I'm a, I'm a professor, as you know, so they do most of the work um, as producers. Right. They are the ones we have produced for. Um, I know that this is supported by Canadian Women's Foundation. We produce a podcast with the Canadian Women's Foundation called okay. Signal for Help. Uh, and that's one that yes, I host. Yes, yes. Um, and, and we've produced a podcast for the Toronto Star and the Samara Center for Democracy. And I'm just so proud of what they've done. I'm so, like, it's amazing. And we are proud of you. Let me tell you, girl. And you know what I love about the story you're telling us about media girlfriends and how it started, a lot of times God is telling us, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I listen. You know right. what had happened? It was, it was during my second, um, my second parental leave when I had the baby and I was like in this existential, what am I, <laughs> what am I doing place? where I like, it was, I remember thinking like, am I just going to breastfeed and clean up shit for my, like, is that, is this me? Is this what I am? And I remember thinking, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, I want to interview. I want to interview. That was like, it, it was a really strong feeling. So yes, God, the universe, it doesn't matter. I, I was just, I was compelled in my spirit to make this thing. I'm loving it. And the reason why, the reason why I'm loving it is, we tend to give ourselves excuses as to why we can't do this and we can't do that. And it keeps coming at us and we keep putting up the resistance. Then the heavens, God said, okay, Historica, 
I'm trying to talk to this girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's trying not to listen. So go, you know. And, and then the funny thing is, here you are, surrounded by people with all the skills that you need to do this. And you're fighting it out I of was. your own, I don't know the word to use, but it's like you're holding on to something so precious. You don't yeah. understand that if you let other people in, it can become something that not blesses just you and your friends, but society at large. Yeah. Congratulations on that too. And congratulations on the many scholarships that you've given to, you know, young girls all over the place. I mean, do you know that your scholarship may have been the key that moved somebody forward? Because as you and I both know, we deal with so much. And then sometimes all you need is a little light. Yes. Yes. Sometimes all you need is a little light. You need a push. You need a push. And you can pick up again because I believe that we all have our strengths and everything. But sometimes we can't do it alone. So congratulations. You've done well. I respect everything that you've done. But now there's this other aspect of... Is it Marianne Shad? I hope I said the name right. Yes, Marianne Shad Carey. Yes. Shall I tell you about her? I've done so, well that I could remember. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congrat Please do tell us about her because okay. let's face it, many of us don't know these stories or these histories that have gone ahead of us. Mm -hmm. You know, so I got excited learning about Marianne Shad and what you are doing for us to establish her name, you know, so that everybody can learn more. So please tell me about her and the work you are doing. So um, Marianne Shad Carey is the, the first black woman publisher in Canada um, or in North America. Um, and she produced it. She published a, a newspaper called the Provincial Freeman. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, sometimes I get this incorrect because she's not only the first black woman publisher in North America, but she may also be the first woman publisher in Canada. Those things I, I, I have to get correct. I, I want to get sure, but I don't have my book with me. So please, whoever's listening, make sure you get it correct. The point is, she was a woman on her own in 1853, published something called the Provincial Freeman. She wrote a lot about um, black people and uh, black people being getting or uh, uh, having equitable treatment. She talked about black people getting education. She talked about women um, and how they are just as good as any gender to specifically men in her time to uh to do anything mm -hmm. that they are very capable human beings and have the intellect and have ability to you know to um to lead things as well and the thing she was also an educator so she she had a printing press she taught us as she taught a school of ch so she taught um children and she also taught adults um she ended up later on in her life she became a lawyer mm -hmm. and she was also a speaker so she went around and did a lot of speaking and, and a lot of the time 1853. she 1853 this is 1853 is when she published the um the, the yeah that was one of the first times that she actually published uh, at, at like weekly when it started weekly and um, when I heard this story, story about her, I remember thinking, why did I not learn this in school? You know? This woman is a badass. She was I love fire. her. Like when I, when I read about her, I think, oh my God, she just didn't care what anybody else thought. That's, like why, she was that's wanted, why I said again in 1853. That's what I'm saying. In 1853, yeah. this was a time when the other people were talking about her and saying, you're a woman, don't talk. You're a woman. Right. Like you, you should not be, this is not befitting of who you should be, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. people were pressed. They were not, they didn't really like that she was going out and, you know, being an unmarried person and, 
going out and you know speaking as she did and there were times when uh she would speak and she just she had the floor this is yeah. what i'm reading i'm i'm a new scholar to marianne shad carey yeah so to yeah. all the people who are listening to me and if you have seen if you have noticed me saying any f facts that are incorrect please tell auntie anna but what i'm learning about her is that she had um, a real force within her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she had a school, she was publishing this paper. Yeah. And um, uh, she has descendants. Mm -hmm. She has people, She there are people who are related to her here in Canada. She was, um, she lived around like the Chatham area um, mm -hmm. and her family came to Canada. She she's also an immigrant. She came to Canada from the United States after okay. the Fugitive Slave uh, Slaves Act was enacted, and this right. is a, when, a time when enslaved people were now uh, it, uh, enslaved and also uh, free black people were just leaving leaving the states because um, their lives were in danger. It's, essentially, right. these were refugees, really. Right. So right. they're leaving and they're coming to Canada. And Marianne Shad Carey's big thing was she was writing a lot to uh to the people in uh the states to say canada is a place you can come mm. you know you can come here come live here this is what it's like this is what the land is like this is what it feels like. these are what the weathers are like she wrote a whole book on this mm. okay. um it, in part it's called the plea for emigration okay and so uh when i was when media girlfriends was producing this black history podcast mm. one of the people we had to do we knew we had to talk about marianne chad carey okay and in the process of having our first meeting talking about who we were going to focus on we were you know there's so many black canadians that we could talk about but who are we going to focus on and uh and my um, my co-founder said, we have to do Marianne Shad Carey. And the researcher who worked with Historica Canada piped up and said that she was related to Marianne Shad Carey. What? Another knock. Can you? Another knock. Knock, knock. Are you listening? I said, what? So she's like the great, great grandniece, some, some, some. So she Marishana has the history. So we said, well, that's interesting. You know, Marishana, you have to be in the podcast. And she was like, uh, no, you're going to be in your po in the podcast. And her mother, Adrienne Shad, who is also a historian, they came on the podcast. Wow. So fast forward to me being at Carleton. And under my mandate, I had an idea that there should be an institution in Canada that is always thinking about journalism, and inclusion or belonging and justice and all of that because we don't have one we right. do have many journalism organizations we have the the canadian association for black journalists we have the canadian journalists of color we have the canadian uh journalism foundation but there is no institution mm. that is researching and really cares about like that that is in their mandate like that's what they're always thinking about yes, outside yes. of like just the, black, like something that is, yeah. and so I think I want. So I wanted to start one, and um, when I was thinking about naming it, I thought about Marianne Shad Carey, and because right. I had the connection to the Shad family, I I called right. them and I told them about my idea, and I said, "Would you give me your blessing to name this center after Marianne Shad Carey?" And they said yes. And I'm so grateful they said yes. And Auntie, I want to tell you, I haven't told anybody yet. Yes, tell um, me, tell me. Just but um, I recently found out that I've gotten two grants <laughs> to start this center um, to a total of about um, about $87,000 um, in grants and grant money to do to start some research and it would be um to support the marianne shad carey center so you know girl what can i say <laughs> i like fiery people <laughs> you know what i mean I like do i have fire i'm joking of course i have fire. Lord have mercy. <laughs> your fire is like blazing and blazing see i hope 
you know, I always tell people these days, when you meet young girls who, you know how they say, oh, she's a bad girl, just send them to me. <laughs> because you see, when you meet young girls who don't take crap, it means they are about something. Yeah. Right? Are and they bad or are we misinterpreting what they really want? I don't this even is... know what bad. That's why I well, said that's what I'm just saying. send them to me. Just send yeah. them to me. Because how is it that whilst everybody's towing the line, this one is out there somewhere in left field, you know, doing her own thing. It's because that person has something that it cannot be pulled in. It has to unfold. And that is what I see with you, you know, that you're moving from blessing to blessing, from struggle to struggle, from cracking new ideas and actually moving towards making it happen, even if you're afraid. And I like that. I like that about you. So what is next for Nana Abba Duncan? <laughs> Because all of us are curious stuff. Well, the big thing that's next is um, actually do is actually doing this research. So I'll explain what the research is. Um, it is uh, twofold. One is to create a guide on reporting in Black communities in Canada, and mm. that will mean that I need to talk to certain different uh, different Black communities as well as journalists, Black journalists, and and and. Um, uh, editorial leaders in general. And the other side of the project is to survey the experiences of Black journalists in Canada. So with that one, I'll, I'll be putting together a survey looking for uh, old, new, um, in the industry, out of the industry, uh, Black journalists to talk about the experiences that they have had um, uh, before George Floyd, during George Floyd, after George Floyd, all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I want what what I'm very sure about is that whatever comes from that research will actually inform not just how we should support black journalists in the newsroom, but how we should support any marginalized community living and working in the newsroom, as well as potentially how to um, better report on uh, marginalized communities in in Canada. I'm I'm sure that it will have that kind of impact. Um, the 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 black the survey on on black journalists uh, um, experiences I think will also tell us a lot about what it's like to be black at work in mm -hmm. general. I think it'll have a lot of implications for that as well. Well, girl, just know that we're all praying for you as you move as you move the way you move. Thank you. Also know that you are a light to somebody who may be sitting somewhere quietly and watching you. I know you're a light to us. I know we're very proud of you because you know, as immigrants, when we come, we have our children and all of that. And so when we see our children in certain places, then we know for sure that the journey hasn't been in vain. Mm -hmm. And also, we now know that our children are in places where they can make a difference. So when it gets tough, when it gets tired, know that you're not alone. Know that we're all out here wishing our sister, our baby, our friend, our firecracker, we are wishing you well. We love you, Nanaba. It's been, I've loved this interview. Well, I knew I would. I mean, why wouldn't I? It's you I'm talking to. Yes. <laughs> right? It's you I'm talking to. So keep on smiling. Okay. okay. I'm keep trying on to see if I can hear you. Something just happened here. Hello? Oh, hello. Can you yes. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but it's okay. kind of a... Yeah, so keep on smiling. Keep working hard. May God be with you and you're in our prayers as always. Be encouraged, be inspired, and stay blessed. We'll connect soon, Nanaba Duncan. Take care. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Nanaba, one of the spotlights of the lives that we're living here in Canada. She's doing her best. I pray and hope that you too are doing your best, going for the things that will surprise you and also 
bring out the best in you. Until then, do share this channel with others so that they too will be inspired. All right? Be encouraged, be inspired. As always, it's the Inspirational Anna Show. Stay blessed.